Hello, hello, welcome. Just give people a minute to get situated with video and audio if, if you so choose. I'm very curious where everybody is from. If you're if you're on the call, maybe just pop in the chat where you are calling in from. Awesome. Some BC and Alberta folks. You can tell I'm in Vancouver. Wonderful. Welcome. Did anyone have a problem with their registration link not working? No. Okay, fantastic. Uh, we did have about 80 res registrants and we had a little blip with a one code, so we were a little unsure, but classic uh, technology from Nova Scotia. Oh, a coast to coast. I love it. Okay, I'm going to just launch a quick poll then um, and ask you what, what your role is. Um, choice seven uh, should really say something else uh, entirely. Uh, and if yours isn't represented in the poll, perhaps you can type it in the chat too. Just get an idea of uh, who's joining us and what your area might be that you are an outdoor leader in or wanting to become. Hi, welcome, Michael. Okay, some got about half the people have answered. I'll give you just a couple of minutes more in case anyone's figuring out. Okay, we've got something else. We've got a choice seven, which you know could be anything. Um, and some early childhood, K to 12, community and formal educators, fantastic, some nature lovers. I love it. Uh, I'm going to just close that up there. So as you can see, a bit of everything going on. A field leader for Skyline Hike, it's very cool. Okay, so welcome. I'm going to let Sydney do the intro and I'll pipe down for a minute and then I'll be... Sounds great. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I am Sydney. I am the administrator behind the OCC. I'm sure I have chatted with a bunch of you via email. So thanks for joining us. Jade will be the host for today's workshop. She is joining us from the Outdoor Learning Center. Outdoor Learning Center. That's where my partner works. The Outdoor Learning Store. <laughs> my apologies. Um, so just a little bit about Jade. She is a physical geographer, environmental educator, outdoor instructor, and guide based in Revelstoke, British Columbia. She's been designing and delivering environmental education programs for over 15 years across four continents and seven countries. She runs outreach and events for the Columbia Basin Environmental Education Network, the Outdoor Learning Store, and Take Me Outside alongside her own educational consultancy, Stoked on Science. Love that name. She's a passionate hiker, biker, climber, skier. And she shares a passion for the outdoors whilst educa educating about science, interconnecting natural systems and the general wonder of the world around us is her number one priority. So without further ado, I'll pass it along to Jade and we'll get rolling. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction, Sydney. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. Um, so yeah, just a quick uh, hello to some familiar faces and some not so familiar faces. Uh, thanks for joining me this afternoon or evening, uh, depending where you are. Um, so the whole point of this is really just to connect you with tools and resources as outdoor leaders. Um, I'm joining you primarily from the Outdoor Learning Store. So we're a social enterprise um, and we offer outdoor learning equipment and resources for educators and learners. And then we funnel all of our profits back into supporting Canadian nonprofits that are anything to do uh, with education and the environment um, and so 
you know, we're spreading our wings. We're kind of uh, going out into North America and, and further afield. Um, but we hope to be able to connect to wherever you are and wherever your place-based learning or adventure program is. Um, hopefully there's a little something there for you. Uh, I'm just gonna start uh, my screen share and we'll get cracking. Um, perfect. Okay, so this is learning tools and resources for outdoor leaders. Uh, that's me uh, teaching uh, in the Slocan Valley just south. So um, I live um, in Revelstoke, BC, uh, which is the traditional and unceded territories uh, of the Snikes, the Shishwemuk, the Tsnaha, uh, and the Okanagan Silks people. It's um, just sort of bottom third quadrant. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse of this. Uh, this is a Snikes uh, produced map uh, from Mar Press. Um, the Columbia River runs right past my home in Tanaha, that's the Miskakas River, the Chickadee River, and uh, this is the land of the Chickadees for the Sinaiks, it's the bull trout. Um, and as a non-Indigenous person, a huge amount of what I do as an outdoor leader is attempting um, to ensure, um, firstly, that I acknowledge uh, the land that I'm on. Uh, and learning and delving deep uh, into that traditional ecological knowledge, which uh, I'll share about a little bit more. Um, so I teach all kinds of things, all kinds of ages. I start down here with these little E's and we're out here just playing games and building mouse houses that have to weather storms and, and keep little, um, you know, camera film canisters full of jello warm if they build the right uh, house for their mouse. Um, I do some fun stuff. Um, again, these are my grade one twos. This is nature through the seasons. Here I am dressed as uh, the spring sprite. And um, I go as a different, I'm the winter witch. Uh, and this is our tree. This is our birch tree. Uh, and we follow it. Uh, so um, it's called, you know, tree buddy. Um, we investigate uh, how she looks uh, in the four different seasons. We investigate what's growing on the tree, around the tree, at the base. Uh, we do a lot of uh, sensory awareness activities with this age. Um, and again, there'll be some more details later. I go up and this is a grade six, seven class where we're teaching out in the wetlands. So I'm teaching in forests, I'm teaching in riverine um, or lacustrine environments too. Uh, I also then run for older kids, either field trips. Uh, this is an introduction to mountaineering course that we took um, about six, yeah, six, um, 15, 16 year olds up and they summited. This is Mount Begbie uh, in Revelstoke. It's kind of actually hiding out shot. This is the very now very tiny big big glacier uh, and I don't know if you could see if you go up from the person standing uh, on the right to the top where the snow is and follow your eye line all the way right where the snow stops you'll see this sort of diagonal line creeping up the rock face that is a ledge you have to cross the glacier onto that ledge go up and then climb the ridge line it's um pretty decent summit we spent three days camping up there it's an 18 kilometer hike uh, to get to the campground, which is the base of these rocks. Uh, so I've been on some good adventures with some very moany teenagers as well. Uh, and then I'm an ACMG uh, top rope climbing instructor um, and um, CAA uh, avalanche uh, technician. So uh, some of those more professional courses that are to do, uh, we're taking all age groups out. Um, but part of what I'm going to say to you is that to be an outdoor leader, you don't have to be hanging off of rock faces with kids or adults or anyone. Uh, you could be down here in the valley bottom next to the golf course, just looking at the rocks. Um, you know, your whatever your risk tolerance or your organisation is, um, there's room for adventure uh, and tools and resources to suit every level. The converging evidence strongly suggests that experiences of nature boost academic learning, personal development and environmental stewardship. It's a paper from Frontiers in Psychology. I mean, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, um, but realistically, we've known this for a long time, but there is an enormous growing literature that supports this. And if you're working in school districts, I'm working with the Ontario Principals uh, Council. I'm working with other school district councils to really go in at um, the higher level management um so that when you're being asked questions if you're in formal education for example like 
why are they outside? Why are they playing? Um, is to actually sort of completely counteract that with that outdoor learning is not a break from education or learning. It's in fact uh, incredibly important for their well-being and academically as well. Um, so again, academic, physical, social, emotional. One of the massive things we've seen with the pandemic is not only has it um, given people the opportunity to reconnect um, and establish how important being outside and nature is for physical health, for transmit lower transmission, but also for that space and peace. Uh, and with my students, I'm out as much as I can to get masks off of faces so that we can breathe deeply. Um, as adults, and yeah, I've seen it through all my students and as adults, our tension, our stress levels, that cortisol stress hormone rushing through our bodies, raises our heart rate, causes us uh, all these kind of hidden things that we don't know what's going on. And being outside lowers the heart rate. It reduces, releases oxytocin, connects us with our happy hormones. Um, but I just wanted to take a minute and a half uh, to look at some pretty pictures and um, to I know we're online, we're virtual, we're spending a lot of time on computers, or I am. Um, you know, Zoom has allowed me to, to share my message or the work of the organisations I work with across Canada and beyond, um, but it also means I spend a lot of more time in front of screens. Um, so I'm just going to get you, and you can turn your camera off if you don't feel comfortable taking some deep breaths um, in front of the camera, but I am going to ask you potentially just to close your eyes for a second. And to take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. You can even sigh and just feel your shoulders release. And this time as you breathe in, raise your shoulders up to your ears and breathe out. So shake down to your fingertips. And then one more deep breath in, tense everything in your body and then breathe out and let that tension go. And in this moment, nobody wants anything from you. And nobody needs anything from you. You can just open your eyes and you can watch a bit of a beautiful scenery. I'm very lucky to live uh, in Revelstoke where this is all local scenery. And to think about every time you see a tree, the root system that's connected to mycelium, sucking up water from our riverways, cleaning the air, carrying oxygen back in that nutrient cycle for us, creating oxygen for us to breathe. When you're out there, think about the different ways you can look, looking through that boundary layer where everything's calmer, following an insect and seeing how they interpret the world. Taking a moment to look at scale, playing games and log hops on natural structures, thinking about how nature exists in your urban centers or what patterns you might see that are mirrored between natural and urban spaces. How fast can you move? How sparkly is it? What colors do you see? What animals do you have with you or that you might see evidence of scat or tracks? Think of the water cleansing you, just rushing over your head top to toe, releasing any stress, any tension you might have in your body. That change in seasons as the snow melts and keeps the forest safe. Um, thank you for indulging me. Um, yes, yeah, so much of, of nature is just being out there. And so, of course, I'm a great advocate for taking courses, for developing your professional skills, but just being out there, taking the time to be out there, whether it's with students or family or friends, is the first step uh, to being a great leader because you're connecting us with our, with our roots, with the things that keep us well. Now, outdoor leadership, um, particularly where I live, is actually not very diverse. OK, so I'm going to talk about diversity, equity and inclusion. Uh, and one of the things that I'm working for towards in my particular area and, and, and wider is, is making sure that um, all people have access to the outdoors uh, and whether that's connecting with uh, minority groups or sharing your experience with um, or 
maybe creating introductory experiences to nature uh, that are not so high level really helps us uh, ensure diversity can happen. Um, not everybody is born uh, with the same socioeconomic background, okay? For some uh, mountains, all those things, I didn't have that. I grew up uh, in East London in uh, the UK. Um, but something as simple as a silk tarp uh, can change any playground into a magical, colorful wonderland. You don't have to be out in the mountains to have fun and to be doing something fun outside. So there are ways that um, tools and resources that I'm gonna share with you can make um, your outdoor learning more equitable and inclusive inclusive inclusivity is incredibly important so um your outdoor or wilderness might not be deep in the mountains if you're working with people with physical disabilities um they might be the local park that's behind the school and you might have to bring a gas stove instead of having a big wood fire uh, and that's just great too or it might um, be out in the mountains. This is Andrew. This is uh, me skiing with my husband with our adaptive sports program. Andrew is a 40 year old uh, man with um, autism. He has autism uh, and he's nonverbal, but yet he's a phenomenal skier and we use really simple tools um, to make the mountain accessible. You might need to think about ratios of, of helpers. And um, I just love this. It makes me so happy. This was last week. It was the best time ever. Okay, leading adventures. Um, I don't know if you are already leading them or whether you are looking to do that. Um, this is one way for me. Um, I did this with a bunch of my grade sixes and I asked them to go off. Uh, they did four sketches um, of different natural things that inspired them. And then I asked them to tell me one word um, or a sentence um, of what nature meant to them. Um, they're pretty shy, but let's have a go. That last student on the end has created a habitat for this slug that she adopted. Um, she did leave it in the forest. Oh, there's me again talking over myself. Um, but one of the things I found when I'm doing outdoor leads is, and that really works, uh, that exercise with older students who are obsessed with their own technology and have their phones and you can't get them to switch it off, is to get them to go away in groups of two, um, ideally where there's no cell service, um, but to record a video of them talking um, about a particular plant. Sometimes I give them cue cards with three key facts and I ask them to present that information either on a video because they don't feel comfortable sharing uh, to a group or to present that information back to their peers. Uh, and that A, helps them retain the information. There's cool facts. I had a group of 18 year old kids um, wrap the entire um, sort of shoreline of that initial picture I showed you. Um, uh, next to the Arrow Lakes Reservoir. And it was like, amazing. It was a phenomenal show and they did it in 20 minutes. Uh, another big thing um, for outdoor leaders is, um, you know, utilizing sort of survival skills or things. Um, and so maybe you um, can't really have a full fire because you've got a fire pit here, but it was a beautiful, bright, sunny summer's day. Um, but I just get these pie dishes and we do a five minute fire. They've got five minutes to collect everything they would need and to see if they can uh, start a fire with a flint. As you can see, um, these bunch of kids um, were very successful. This was a slightly bigger fire. This is with a recreational group after school. Um, G on the right here has um, made us all hot chocolate on this camping stove on the log. Uh, and we had marshmallows and a fire and they made everything. Uh, and one of the things you'll see is they're all sitting on sit pads, which is one of the things um, that we have in the store that makes a massive difference, whether you're doing a meditation spot or um, they work quite well with Frisbees uh, or as um, sort of sleds coming or sliding down snow hills. Um, but those sorts of things, A, they look after them and they're responsible for it. So it gives them something to focus on. They also just don't get cold and wet butts, which uh, really helps. 
Moving up in age groups. Oh, apparently my audio is not on. I hope you could hear. If not, sorry, I just saw that. Um, I can show you the videos again. Uh, so um, here I am with a bunch of uh, two classes of grade nine students, and we're looking at uh, water quality and uh, nutrient cycling as part of the new BC curriculum. What's interesting is while we were here, this sort of little pond, this is Montana Creek. Uh, it's the outflow that comes down from our ski resort. Um, and they wanted to create a better spawning site for fish. And there's a culvert off screen right here. Uh, and so what they did was dig out the pretty successful uh, breeding pond that was there. And what they did was cut down all the trees where these students are standing, lose all the shade over the water. They also then dug uh, the substrate out of this sort of pond area. And what they didn't do was create a steep enough angle. So everything, uh, all the sediment coming through the culvert has just been piling up. And now every six months, or less, they have to dig the culvert out. Um, and the fish don't like it because there's no shade. They only come down into this sort of back part. Uh, they don't come into the actual breeding pond because there's no um, nothing to protect them. And while we were there, the officials were coming to check the culvert and it was a really nice demonstration of utilizing what you see on your walk or your adventure to um, create inquiry. So I said, so what do you think happens when humans um, you know, change a landscape? Does it always work for the better? Do we always know best? And it created quite a lot of um, conversation with these students. I think wherever you are, doesn't even matter if you're just walking around a school block, um, find something interesting, point it out, and then ask them to talk about it and give them a voice. Uh, this is taking kids up mountains again. Um, and they'd done a huge hike. They were physically tired, but they were jazzed. And for some of them, it was their first night sleeping alone, especially in a tent. Um, and uh, they were like sort of freaking out and didn't know what to do. And they didn't have, you know, iPads and anything else. So I asked them to do me some, um, some sketches uh, and journal a little bit about this experience because um, memories fade. So they settled down to do that. Is uh, that's actually me looking down the valley, trying to sketch out a little bit. And this was one of my students, um, and he was really um, like shy about showing it. And then he was actually really proud of it. We also did some wildflower sketches, and um, yeah, doing field sketches and it is an incredible skill. As a geographer, I spent a lot of time doing it, not only to being able to identify, you know, distance, scale, uh, thinking about, you know, which compass point on you for navigation and reasons, um, points of interest, animals, where did you see things? Um, there's really just endless possibilities for a sketch. Ask them to sketch only an inch high or two, two centimeters high from the ground, get them lying down looking, ask them um, to sketch only the things that are above head height and get them to start to look at the different levels it can be such an incredible tool. Um, here, working with a, a local environmental nonprofit, we were planting 400 trees in a restoration project uh, at a provincial park. And one of the biggest things I find uh, working with adults is that they are not very good at listening to instructions. It's the key thing that I have. Kids listen, they do well. Um, I have, you know, personally been involved in a ski guiding accident where someone did not follow the rules and half buried the rest of the team um, because they didn't want to, to follow the rules, which were very sort of clearly laid out. So uh, we were out here trying not to trample the existing um, previous planting, um, but here we're listening to um, an environmental scientist who's kind of spearheading uh, and we're getting our plans and we've got all kinds of age groups together, but it was a, a really nice project. Um, this is Chief uh, Mike Archie of the uh, Canim Lake uh, Shushwap Tribal Band, uh, and he came um, to bless our plantings and share some cultural, um, oh, just some amazing information about uh, the medicine people, the plants and the medicines that they give us. And that's him with his wife and daughter. Uh, we had a drum ceremony, it was magical. And I think uh, one of the biggest takeaways from that was that, yes, these aren't just plants, they're not just things, they have spirit, they're part of our connected circles and 
if in your work as an outdoor leader, you can connect them with that mentality, you know, this two eyed seeing science and traditional knowledge, which are often basically the same thing anyway, but with a slightly different language. Um, everybody, the 40 people that were there were completely touched um, by this interaction. Uh, and it's important to uh, uplift and and hold on to indigenous culture that we've done extremely well to decimate. Uh, some of your adventures might be out in the winter time when of course you're starting to look at um, much more complex weather uh, and scenarios and um, this gentleman in green here is one of our search and rescue leaders. Uh, I'm on our search and rescue team. He's a phenomenal ski guide, avalanche forecaster, absolute professional, and he's talking about snow and safety there. And then my job as tail guide and um, general carrier of extra stuff uh, or person is that when we're out in this scenario, firstly, yeah, have, have the expertise to do so. We were going into avalanche terrain. If you are not a mountain guide, don't, don't do that. Um, they were quite slightly disappointed that um, on this lady Kit Kat's birthday that they weren't going to go and be able to do the big alpine traverse that they wanted to do because the conditions were just really, you know, touchy, spicy, a bit scary. Um, and so he was explaining that we were going to go and ski a pretty standard run that's fun, uh, but not exactly what they were looking for with a paid guide uh, called the Ravens. And then I swooped in with my knowledge um, about what the Raven means um, for Indigenous um, culture here and told this whole story that it was, you know, synchronous that we were the Raven and it was all about change and development and growth on your birthday. And it just like changed the whole mood. So I think having um, that interpretive aspect of whatever you're doing, um, you don't have to be a scientist, you don't have to be, um, you know, the world leader, but if you've, you know, taken the chance to have just a few key facts that stick in people's minds, it's just, it's just mind blowing. You know, again, the Taha call this the chickadee valley, and we saw so many black cat chickadees. Well, a chickadee will hide between 80 and 100,000 seeds uh, in its winter, in preparation for its winter. And it has one of the, and with kids, I describe this differently, but it has one of the most fascinating and um, incredible scale neuroplasticities of any animal. So in fall, it will grow its neural pathways by 20% in order to remember over winter where it's hidden all these food stashes. And then in spring, it just like shrinks back. Now with little kids, I have a dress up kit where I have like a black mask and a black hood and a pink ball of yarn that's a brain and I stuff it in and a uh, chickadee's heart beats at 500 beats per minute to keep it warm and I have a metronome that beats that fast. And with these guys, it's just enough to tell them the simple fact and they're like, oh, that's nice. Also distracts them if they're sweaty or, I mean, they shouldn't be sweaty if they're ski touring, but if they're tired or, you know, feeling a bit slow, um, a bit of conversation, a bit of connection goes a long way. Um, yeah, this is, uh, we were planning the next part of our trip. Um, the lady in front is an ACMG ski guide and I'm her um, dressed twin in this photo, but she's my mentor. Um, and we're talking about um, what we expect to see. If for any reason when you're out there and something is giving you uh, the heebie-jeebies, um, a massive part of being an outdoor leader is to trust your intuition. And I find that time spent um, really improves that. But it really could just be so much if I've got a funny feeling. Um, and it could be animal, it could be mineral, it could be weather incoming. Uh, you might have more stable weather where you live, but um, massive thing is just just turn back or dial it back or go somewhere that feels a little less intense uh, because that intuition is your limbic system that was developed over hundreds of thousands of years, picking up on things that you, you know, your, your thinking part of your brain can't quite uh, anticipate. Uh, so that's always my big thing. If you feel a bit weird, uh, go back. Um, here we were running, um, this lady over here is a, Herbologist was talking again about plant medicines. Uh, she's not indigenous, but um, uh, she's an ethnobotanist, so she studied and uh, is very connected um, to indigenous elders who've shared their information with her. I think, you know, 
make sure you leave paths clear. This is not a perfect example, so other people can utilise the space. Be thoughtful about where you're sitting if you are going to stop. Um, but this was a really amazing adventure. We went for probably a two kilometre walk, which for all of these people was not a difficult uh, environment, but just stopping, looking, um, taking notes, sketching, even if you don't know what it is, or you sketch, take a photo of it and then look it up later. I also like to do that with teenagers, um, taking pictures, then uploading them to a, an app like iNaturalist or Plant ID, uh, and then getting them to research, um, you know, medicinal purposes or historical uses of a plant can really tie them into their place uh, and getting to know it more deeply. And when we know things, we care for them. Science has proven that over and over again. So with the littlies, we get I get them to recognize uh, shape. They play uh, match the leaves. So one of their um, pairs goes out and finds a leaf, only fallen items, nothing live off of trees. Um, and then they bring it back and then their friend has to go and find a matching one. And even that, just looking at shape and starting to ID can build this relationship um, with the nature that will lead to um, stewardship. I skipped one um okay gosh if you need to focus a group and you are lucky enough to be anywhere with rocks uh, or a beach or whatever rock sorting is an amazing way to bring maths and uh, science outdoors so um I do this inside if you have to you can go and collect a bunch of different rocks and put them in a brown paper bag and I just have like a big piece of green card and I put it on the desk um, but out here I ask the students to find four sticks as long as their arm and then whatever was in the square I asked them to sort the rocks and they had two minutes to do it and then I asked them you know what categories did you do and most will do size you know small medium big and then color uh, and then I asked them to do it again they can't use the same category so then they have to go through size they go through color and then they're like oh how do we do this maybe it's you know um smoothness roughness texture uh, and then we start to look at you know spotty stripy and then you can start to talk about geology you can talk about the history of of where these rocks came from why are they smooth well that's the river transporting them um and you can just delve deeper and deeper and deeper and i have a bunch of worksheets on this if anyone's interested um and i've done this with Kindergartners, I've done it with grade 12s, obviously to a, you know, a different standard. Um, if you're in the classroom, you can use a table, you can get them to start to plot that table. Um, another thing I like to do if it's warm enough is to give them a rock behind their back and close their eyes um, and then pass it around a circle. And then I give them three options that may be the same and they have to identify which rock it was that they were holding blindfolded and that can be looking at texture and and learning that you know if you have straight lines in a rock it's a sedimentary rock that was made from dead things floating to the bottom of the ocean a million years ago or if it's wavy lines or has sparkles in it that's a metamorphic rock which was that layered rock getting smushed with heat and pressure and you know going through this massive transformation like these things um you know yeah, rocks are a little bit my specialist subject, but you don't have to have this deep knowledge for it to convey these sort of very simple things that um, that make them see you as a leader and knowledgeable while you're out there. Collect some stuff. Uh, we I had a group collect sand, a group collect moss from again less than ten percent of uh, everything we could find. Um, uh, I'll send worksheets in the follow up email um, and then uh, mud and so they were off um, collecting this and then we talk about responsible harvest right we talk about not taking the first bit of moss you see or the last and making sure you don't take more than 10 percent so I got them to plot a meter squared and they were allowed to take um, you know a couple of handfuls from each spot and then go on an adventure these big jars go on your local buy and sell someone will give you one for free um, and then um in order to come up to the box, they were all lined up in teams. In order to come up to the box to start layering, uh, this is an ecosystem in a jar activity, they had to answer a fun question, a uh, quiz question about, um, you know, where, what, what causes rocks to become smooth? Oh, water or wind. Um, so they came up and they filled them up. And then these are their um, little ecosystems, which we sealed with some 
um, baking paper, um, little uh, plastic recycled bottle lid with water creates water. And these will actually live for years on a sunny windowsill. It is a self um, producing uh, ecosystem. I, uh, as you can see here, we have the uh, Revelstoke Bengal tiger, um, which is a native species. Um, but no, I go to charity shops or thrift stores and find uh, unloved toys and I stick them in there because it makes the kids happy. Um, but after about two weeks, this class saw it started to see all these little worms and insects hatching out from the soil and becoming a part of the ecosystem. And it creates, again, so much room for inquiry. So if you want to go and be an outdoor leader and then bring your knowledge back into a classroom or into a rec center for follow up or debrief, um, these simple things can be can be done. Um, when you're out there, it doesn't matter. We have a, this is in front of a, a local managed forest. It, it honestly doesn't matter whether you're in this big, pristine wilderness environment or whether you're in a park. Um, go outside and, and pose a question or uh, here we were looking at biodiversity and we went to map some of the species we could find. Um, it really yeah you don't have to be miles and miles away um but the same rules apply you know keep everyone safe keep them in a group uh and they will be interested this is a very lackadaisical bunch of grade 11 um science students uh we were doing a whole thing on climate change and as soon as we were outside the other thing i did with them was play a massive game of camouflage um i don't know if any of you know that it's kind of like a run and tag game one person's back and they're all camouflaged and then eventually they have to come back to the base to get food water and shelter uh, which the person who's at the base shouts uh, and they have 30 seconds to come and tap uh, the log and go back and hide and become camouflaged again if you get spotted you're out um another one we play is catch a wave i don't know if any of you've heard this works brilliantly with adults and children of all ages uh, everyone goes hide except for me uh, and then i'm walking through if I see someone hiding, they have to join behind me in a line as a snake and we move through the forest. You need trees or cover or bush or uh, rocks or buildings uh, in order to make this work. You have to be able to hide. But as we're walking through the forest, if the person who's been caught by me behind me can spot someone hiding, and can catch a wave from them. So that hidden person throws them a wave. If they can catch that wave without me, the leader seeing them, they can sneak back into the forest. So you've got this constant rotating of hiding, being found and connecting. Uh, and, and it's just amazing. Um, whenever I need to focus or bring kids in, I do this sort of high burn energy um, activity game, always play games, and then they come back in and they're ready to learn. Um, one of the big things I've, I've done from running all kinds of outdoor camps and mountain bike instructing and rock climbing, hiking and skiing um, is that they're all in different individuals. So you have to celebrate individual wins. Uh, these two um, lovely young people on the left here um, didn't feel comfortable going to summit Mount Begbie, which, you know, we were on a short rope and we were doing things. So on this particular day, they just hung out and we went and played with the marmots and um squirrels and and went and sketched wildflowers and built rock towers um these tours to help you know rebuild the trail so people would know where they were going um and that was that was exceptional to them and i think being having the capacity to be able to say okay you you're not going to reach the objective but that doesn't matter that builds a resilience that I wish many of the people who are skilled in the mountains that I know uh, were better at being able to step back from from final objectives uh, it's a really good learning lesson um, if it's wet find or make a shelter um, I've got a bunch of kids here we were supposed to be rock climbing it was hammering it with rain so what we did I had a black plastic bag because I always do or um, and we went to search for dry wood to make a fire and so we were looking under this big overhanging rock uh, to look for dry sticks and under things. And that took up like an hour just searching for the stuff and it kept them focused and it made them happy. Um, yeah, turn anything, any challenge you have, any problem into a survival scenario, into a right. Okay, 
well, the worst case has happened, or, you know, is someone's shoe broken or whatever? Well, now we're in an actual scenario, but we have all the tools, hopefully, to do it. Um, always have fire lighting equipment. I'm sure you all know this, whether you are, yeah, going near or far. Um, here's a couple of kids. Uh, we made some fun shelters in the forest. And then this kid, something about risky play. Um, climbing trees or climbing rocks, as long as it's under head height, i.e. their feet don't go above their head height. The mechanism for a severe spinal injury is double your height. Uh, basically um, at this height you know he's balanced he's looking at me he's actually holding onto this log I said nothing no be careful and if someone's doing something that's a bit uncomfortable I try and use language like have you got an exit plan what's going to happen um, if that stick moves and just having a conversation with them so they can work through their own um, process kids playing like this builds their own sense of risk management without you having to shout at them. So when you're not there, they don't do something crazy stupid. Um, yeah, I, I'm a massive believer in risky play and giving kids the opportunity to fall down a little bit. Um, okay, we took a bunch of kids. Uh, this was for a young leaders course. We're up on, right behind my husband and I is a very steep, like 200 meter vertical wall down to the Jordan River and uh, these kids are very comfortable out we've been doing lots of survival stuff um, but I don't know if you notice but we are using our bodies as a barrier on that edge if anyone's falling down it's us uh, and you can absolutely work hard uh, to keep them go into places where there are edges, but you can identify the edge and then create some sort of human barriers but yeah make sure that they are aware of their environment as well. Um, have a dedicated GPS as well as your phone, have a paper map and compass, know how to use it. There's a bunch of free navigation courses and the OCC support in that. Like um, I can't stress enough, um, if you are going on some bigger missions, knowing where you are, um, there is a potential that in this particular route, for example, that there could be a mudslide that could block our exit. Uh, so there might be some changes to your plans that you need to, to do on the fly. Uh, we were doing some navigation and tall grass here. I turned it into a treasure hunt. So I hid a bunch of stuff with some basic um, instructions of um, using um, different headings to follow on their compass. Uh, we started off with just North, East, South, West, and then it got more detailed and there were sweeps at every station. So they were very motivated to do well. Um, with adults and youth mix, don't just trust that the adults will do the right thing. They always need instruction. Um, one of the massive things for me is getting youth to devise the plan, especially older youth, give them ownership of small decisions, have them take pictures, use technology to, where are we? Show me. What's the best route to get to the next spot? Uh, and they will stick with you. And one of the most important things for me is have young people teach and take control of learning. So we're doing something called um, rotational interpretation. Uh, so you start with one group, they go into the forest. I teach them three facts about um, this birch tree uh, and then they repeat it to me. And then another group comes along um, Birch tree teach the new students, students, new students move on to the next plant or species, lichen, moss, you know. Um, did you know that that lichen is 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 fungi and algae working together in a symbiotic relationship? Like I teach eight-year-olds that and their minds are blown and they remember it. So the next group goes along, the next group comes, learns from both groups, and then moves along the line, and eventually each group gets to the end and then the first group comes to the next group and they learn and then they go with the two groups it's actually a little bit complicated when you say it in this instinct um but i'll give some instructions and it makes sense but everyone learns from everyone and they end up learning facts uh, from their peers they learn how to communicate um how to to just you know use their voices they're so often just texting now a lot of them are not very good at making eye contact or speaking publicly and I think it's a really important skill and being outdoors outside of a walled room I find gives them the opportunity to make more uh to have more confidence in that 
So um, there's some general things, but here are some um, legitimate tools and resources that the Outdoor Learning Store um, have curated uh, to help you with these things. Um, so for the younger kids, we have a bunch of books um, that are really have been massively integral to the activities that I do. Like the Big Book of Nature activities breaks it down by season. It's North America. Um, wide uh, with breakdowns for like Pacific Northwest and interior and, and coastal. Um, so you can just literally follow a script of, of short ideas that goes along. Julia Robertson's this incredible Scottish woman who's like dirty teaching is, is like the epitome. If you don't know where to start, um, just go there. It's these short little paragraph activities that you can just take, no prep needed outside. They work for school, they work for recreation. Um, school garden curriculum is if potentially you're looking um, for something a little bit more in depth. It's not just like growing a school garden, it's all kinds of links to ecology and cycles and science. And um, there's an entire school year of lessons or after school clubs or um, summer programs there. One of my favorite people is Romy Rodin. Um, we just sold out of his CDs, but you can get them on Spotify. Um, and they are like fun, ridiculous amazing songs like what's that habitat c'est quoi l'habitat they do their bilingual they talk about beavers and caribou and salmon and let's get drastic about plastic is another one they are fun you can play them at the beginning you can play them in the bus if you have to get a bus somewhere it makes people happy um Indigenous resources, natural curiosity is all about indigenous perspectives. Uh, Sila and the Land is um, written and illustrated by three young indigenous women um, from different First Nations. We stock um, these books from Strong Nations, which is an indigenous owned publishing house um, that uh, are all different First Nations, again, specific. And then we have um, new ones coming out that are Métis. Um, I start with a story, you know, I will take one of these books, they're really thin, I will take one of these books and I start with a story, any age group, connect them to the space. Um, and then we, yeah, we wonder about it. Um, equipment, actual things, field guides. I like these ones because they're paper thin, you could stick them in a pocket, they're waterproof and um, bend proof. You don't have to know all of the names of the birds and the trees. Just ask them to open it and go and find it, and then they will know the name of it. You know, you this turns anybody into an expert, uh, and we have them for every province and every kind of thing you can think about. Um, and then, yes, if you want to delve into it, look at stuff up close. We have magnifiers. We have these two-way handheld things where if you go pond dipping with our little nets, you can put them inside there and look or picking up a pine cone or a leaf, which might have caterpillar eggs on the underside becomes a whole magic thing. And then, you know, if you want to tying it in with literacy or art, draw it or write a poem about it or tell a story about it, act out what you think might happen to those eggs next. Like the, the, Things are endless. If you give any kid a clipboard with a very simple scavenger hunt or ask them to follow a sheet or follow a very simple map, they will be more focused than if they don't have something in their hands. Um, it also teaches them about being careful with things and not just dropping them in puddles and looking after things. I find that's really important for me. Um, these are like kids' binoculars. Honestly, although saying that I use these now instead of big ones because they just fit in a pocket. They're only 10 times magnification, so it's not going to blow anybody's mind. But um, we saw an eagle that was sitting in on a sort of stony bank in the river and we took turns. We had two pairs between like eight kids and we just took turns watching. Uh, and it looked like he was just sort of patrolling and, and fishing and, and they were sort of making up this whole story for for Mr. Eagle and um, what was going on in his life. So. 
that was really important. Uh, again, sit pads, we have these ones, we have big ones, um, if you're looking for something a bit more sturdy. Um, when I do dig snow pits for avalanche work, I kneel on one of these. Um, when I'm teaching, I always have one, they slide in the back of your backpack. They also, if you have to perform first aid, make a really nice thermal barrier. If you've got somebody who's sitting with a broken ankle or a broken leg, even in summer, you lose an enormous amount of heat through the body, through into the ground, stick something like that underneath them, put an extra layer on them, uh, and you're in a much better position than you were without it. Also cushions, your spine, if you take a tumble, um, carrying it in your backpack, I normally slide it in just right but next to my spine, uh, and it does an, a pretty darn good job of um, sort of providing a bit of safety too. Um, if you've ever not had the opportunity and in winter you can do this straight after school right but take kids outside in the night sky we don't have a lot of clear skies here um but it's an opportunity to delve in and talk about light pollution where are the light sources getting them to draw it looking at basic installations these guides we've got actually glow in the dark so it's pretty amazing playing laser tag uh, with head torches on kids um is an amazing game um, where you get caught in the beam. Everyone except the it person has got their lights off. It teaches them um, proprioception and being careful. Um, so I highly recommend um, getting out and investigating the night sky. I also will put a link. Um, there's an amazing free um, app called Stellarium, which is this 3D interactive uh, planetarium, and it's got um, you know, like indigenous stories. It's got the Greek, it's got the Roman history of, of constellations. It's incredible. And you can line it up on your screen, on a computer or whatever, for your exact location and what direction you're looking in. Uh, and to show them that, even if it's cloudy, or then maybe then go outside and try and identify those things um, is amazing. Um, I love to do citizen science with anybody of any age. Um, we have these kits from water rangers. We have tiny ones that are super inexpensive up to these like wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, everything, legit science. The dissolved oxygen, which is this blue set of test tubes here, they have to like snap a thing, snap a test tube off and pour liquids together and create this chemical reaction in the field. It's amazing. Um, they come with field books uh, and instruction manuals. You can then submit that data to your local water group, or you can submit it to whichever government's closer to you. You can actually make a massive difference and engage whoever it is that your audience is in that. Uh, and I highly recommend it because it gives them a great sense of achievement. As they get older, um, some of more books that we do, like teaching kids or teens about climate change, these are really amazing, short. Some of them are practical games. Some of them are like uh, printout strategy games or where they have to make decisions based on inputs and outputs. Uh, connecting the dots talks about sustainability in a way um, that really gets kids, again, critical thinking much earlier than I ever started doing it. Walking curriculum, if you're a recreationist or you're running outdoor camps or anything, a walking curriculum, it's like 40 different walks. It's a shapes walk, it's a cracks walk. You can do it anywhere. They are bite-sized and they are, they are mind blowing. And then there's like three follow-up questions. And I have literally had one, you know, gone on a, on a cracks walk where we've walked around the park and the playground around school and they have to follow cracks and see where they lead and then ask them like, what caused that crack? You can get into like weathering and geography. It's, it's mind blown. Um, anything place-based if you're early learning, David Sobel is incredible. He's joining us. He joins us for every workshop series we do. He's got another one in the spring's just about to be announced. He's gonna do map making with kids. Um, his books are incredible. Uh, and teaching about invasive species is a massive part of climate um, education. You can't, uh, invasive species don't connect with our pollinating insects. Um, they cause all kinds of trouble. They proliferate at the expense of our native species. Uh, and it's a really amazing way if you're on a walk, you can do an invasive species, species pool. You can connect with your local invasive species council. Um, again, straight into citizen science and uh, real action projects. 
And the last set of resources, uh, maybe for some of you as adults, if any of you haven't read Braiding Sweetgrass or Gathering Moss by Robin Wall Kirima, Kimura, she's an indigenous biologist uh, based just across the border. Um, it's incredible. It will change the way you feel about being in nature. Uh, you will learn an enormous amount about um, the Pacific Northwest ecology and um, what we get from the plants rather than just take, take, take. It's, um, it's pretty incredible. Uh, Groundswell, uh, a series of essays, the same with People's Curriculum for the Earth. They're like essays. And then um, People's Curriculum for the Earth has these things where you can do um, like summit action projects where they uh, are different indigenous councils from different parts of the world speaking at a Congress and getting kids thinking um, about decision making and sustainability uh, and and life um, as adults. Any of those um two books on the edge will also work if you are looking for team building exercises if you're looking for people to delve into uh learning more about their space and place particularly from an indigenous uh perspective uh, cannot recommend enough <sighs> i tend to uh speak a lot and rather quickly so i hope you got most of that um i will ask you if you have any questions or if um you feel shy you could write in the chat what you were hoping to get out of um this and then i can see if there's anything i haven't uh, answered um thank you thank you for listening um if you ever want to reach out to me or for advice or support or to connect um with what you're doing and the fantastic work you're doing um please do i will put my you'll get a follow-up email from me personally with all of um some links to resources and things uh and to let you know oh ariel can you clarify what you said about algae being made by algae oh lichen lichen is actually algae uh, and fungi together uh so the algae photosynthesizes uh so therefore creates the food and the fungi creates basically a structure a home for it to live and that creates lichen so it's this incredible symbiotic relationship um and and honestly again i taught that to an eight-year-old and she just like sent it back to us. Uh, Nicholas says he's done a lot of community education in urban spaces in social justice. And that's huge. Um, yeah, it really depends where you live. It's very difficult for a lot of the students or young people where I live to think about social injustice because they are privileged white individuals living in an expansive natural environment. Um, and so introducing those uh, is really, really important. And books like uh, People's Curriculum for the Earth or teaching kids or teens about climate change asks them to look at things from a different perspective. It starts to engage them with empathetic thinking, uh, with critical thinking, uh, and that can be, yeah, incredibly important for their well-rounded uh, support. Um, Oh gosh, I'm not living in Sydney much time to talk about um, the Outdoor Council of Canada, but if you haven't done their field leader course, they'll delve more into the mechanics of how planning a trip, doing all these things. Um, but if you're ever interested in content uh, and, and need some support or want to reach out, um, please do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jade, uh, for sharing all of your wealth of knowledge with us. I won't go into too much detail about the OCC just to respect everybody's time. And I know Jade has a little something, something for the folks that are on the call. So <laughs> hang on till the end, don't leave yet. Um, <laughs> but just, just quickly, we're working really hard at the OCC to uh, develop our field leader program. So that's our courses in hiking, uh, paddling, winter, overnight, equine, maps and compass. So if any of those interest you and you haven't taken them, please, I'll, I'll post the link and I'll put my email in the chat. Uh, you can check it out more on our website. If that, if you've already done that and you want kind of the next step thing, we've also got our instructor training so you can become an OCC instructor to deliver our field leader courses. And that's also such a wonderful um, license that you can add to your tool belt. And it's also just great knowledge and uh, networking. So are they virtual? Um, 
Depends on the instructor. Most of our instructors are independent, so they, they choose themselves. Some of them are running virtual courses, as virtual as we can be. So the classroom portion will be virtual, but then the field portion is still gonna be in the field with, with everybody uh, there, social distancing, uh, following the appropriate uh, protocols for COVID. I hope that answered the question. I'm just gonna, uh, there's two links here. The leadership training is on the field leader courses and then the become an instructor. I am the administrator. We just had hired a brand new program coordinator. Her name is Linda Leckie, if any of you know her. She's based out of Ontario. She's actually also uh, OCC instructor and instructor examiner. So she has tons of knowledge um, and experience behind her, so. Nova Scotia is actually a place we are developing right now, so you can expect to see more things coming down the pipeline. Uh, feel free to shoot me an email, Ashley, and I can get you connected with some folks out there that that can get you looked up, uh, hooked up with some courses. Um, other than that, if you have any other questions, feel free to shoot me an email, and I'll pass it back to Jade Quick uh, <laughs> since we're we're just over six o'clock mm. now. Yeah, I'll be very quick. Um, I just put a couple of links. We have a bunch of workshops coming up in the spring with um, the best educational minds of um, Canada and beyond uh, sharing about outdoor and environmental learning. So um, they're all free to register. I'm hosting and I'll be hosting our guests. They're some of the people that wrote the books that I was just talking about. Also, we have a little podcast with um, Green Teacher. If you want to listen, we interview some of these authors um, or decision makers makers and we try and keep it light and airy but if you're having a cup of tea um and looking for conversations it's called earthy chats uh, and you can find it anywhere that you get um your podcasts uh, but there's a straight link there um okay I've got two $25 gift cards to give away to the outdoor learning store um that'd get you a book or a couple of field guides or pair of binoculars or something so um, I'm going to ask you to type uh, so have your typing fingers at the ready and as today's Tuesday I'm going to ask you to um, and not until I say go but I'm going to ask you to give me three words that begin with T don't hit enter between them but three words that begin with T that connect you or make you um or that are important to outdoor learning or being an outdoor leader. So three letter words beginning with the letter T, all typed in a row. First pair, two people to get me um, three T words win the gift cards. Ready, set, go. <laughs> Trees teaching tenacity. Oh, Ariel, very nice. Trees training and tenderness. Ashley, lovely. Turtles, trees, trombone. Nicholas for comedy and joy um i love yours too um let me see i reckon we could go for gold silver and bronze um it's all the same but i'll i'll get one to you too nicholas um i have your emails um in my registration so i've just screenshotted that i will send you guys an email with a 25 dollars gift card uh thank you so much uh, for participating participating uh, in this workshop. I hope I didn't just uh, ramble loudly at you for an hour. Uh, and again, I'll send you a follow up email from my personal email. So if you have any questions, comments or concerns or just want to brainstorm anything, I'm very willing to help. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for taking just over an hour out of your day to spend some time hanging out with us. We appreciate you all. We do. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sydney. Thank you, Jade.